Music for this episode of About to Break is provided by Cat Beach Music. Whether you're looking to score an entire film or just need to find the perfect vibe for your next commercial project, our friends Bobby and Jen Hartree have what you're looking for. Check them out today at catbeachmusic.com. Hello, everybody. I'm Taylor, and this is the About to Break podcast. It's the show where we talk to artists and entertainers about this crazy roller coaster of the entertainment business. And uh, if you're listening the day this comes out on May 16th, it means that Katie and I are in Atlanta. We've been here a couple days spending some time with some of our best friends in the world, uh, one of whom is on the podcast this week. My guest today is PJ Colbreth. PJ has done everything from show running major concerts across the United States to tour managing, basically anything that you do backstage to make the people on stage look and sound great. Uh, PJ is one of the best I've ever met. And beyond that, he is just an amazing friend. I'm so grateful that he agreed to do the podcast. He and his wife, Rachel, came to stay with us a few weeks ago. And now today we're in their neck of the woods in Atlanta. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Uh, But if you're around tonight in the ATL, I'm performing this evening at Smith's Old Bar. I'm so excited. It's a great venue, and it's going to be good times. Tonight, 7 o'clock, come by, say hi. Uh, If you're not in Atlanta, maybe you're in Los Angeles. I will be back in L.A. for a show this Tuesday, May 22nd at 7 p.m. We're going to be doing the Low Bar Variety Hour. This is a show where I just invite a bunch of friends in the industry to come and try brand new stuff. So we've got a great lineup this time. I've got Matt Marcy doing Magic. I've got um, Matt McCarthy, amazing stand-up comedian that you've heard here on the podcast. You've also heard Matt Marcy on the podcast. They will both be there trying new stuff. Adam Wiley, who was our guest on last week's show, is going to be there. Rob Balchunas is going to be there. Armax Goodwin. And we've also got music from A Horse, A Spoon, A Bucket. It's going to be great. Hope to see you guys there. That's May 22nd at the Clubhouse. And you know what? Maybe you're not in Atlanta or Los Angeles. Maybe you're in Orlando. I'll be performing June 4th in Orlando, Florida at Wizards Magic Theater. And then let's see. End of June, I'll be back at the Magic Castle. And in July... Uh, July 29th through August 5th, I'm going to be going to Branson, Missouri, performing at Silver Dollar City for their Moonlight Madness Festival. Tickets and info for all of those shows are available on my website, taylorhughes.com forward slash live. So go check that out. And if you're making plans to come to a live show, please drop me a line on the website about to break podcast.com or on social media. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to see you. Love to connect. Love to hang a little bit. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the producers of the show. Our newest producer, Natalie Allen, just signed up for $5 a month. Natalie, thank you so much. Uh, longtime friend, and I'm so grateful that you are enjoying the podcast enough to uh, to give to it. If you love the show and you listen to it every week, I'd encourage you to become a producer for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, you can be a producer of the show. We've got some people to give a dollar a month. we got some people to give $50 a month. So thank you so much to the producers of the show for making this possible. And this one is another great conversation. I know you're going to be encouraged by it. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. I guess this is... What episode is this? I think it's episode... Is it 73? No way. Hold on. i got to check. I can't believe it's that many. Oh my goodness, it is. Episode 73. Guys, sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with my good buddy, PJ Colbreth. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. Hey, everybody, you're listening to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes. And I am elated that my buddy PJ Colbreth is sitting in the shed quarters right now. Welcome. Thanks. Oh, dude. <laughs> this Happy is a beer. This has been a long time coming. Yeah. PJ has yeah. been uh, behind the scenes in this journey since the beginning. We we talked about this podcast, and long before this, we talked about the other podcast that we're both obsessed with and love. I think probably half the people on the show have been on because they know PJ. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm the uh, talent agent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the, he's the executive producer of the podcast because he finds all of the guests. I also am very excited right now because I this will be episode like 73 or something like that it's of the insane. show, like which is nuts. Um, but every episode, I've been annoyed by the cord on the headphones. And then PJ, being the pro that he is, and uh, we'll get into his expertise here in a second, sat down and put the headphones on and threw the cord like a boss behind his back. And now I've never <laughs> felt so comfortable and free in my life. It's everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been talking about doing this forever, man. You, you and I do a lot of events throughout the year together. So it's funny because we're never in either of our hometowns. We're always in like some random place in America. Right. <laughs> doing some event and it's like, you know, four glorious nights and five wonderful days. Uh huh. And then we uh we see each other later. <laughs> right. So this so to have you here in Upland has been pretty rad. Yeah, it's awesome. I know we only worked one event this spring together. That's crazy. So it was great you know? that I was in your house, your town. I got to stay for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Give people a little bit of a background on PJ and what he does. PJ is the guy who probably is more responsible for what happens on stage without ever being on stage. So he's done everything from tour managing to audio mixing to running entire events. You're like the man behind the curtain. You're the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. yeah that makes everybody so. look good and sound good. And you deal with a lot of nonsense too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first start doing production? How did that come um, about? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was 15, 16 years old and I'd gotten involved with the worship band at our, in our youth group. Yeah. And, uh, were we you didn't... playing at the time or? Yeah. I okay. Was, I was playing, uh, acoustic guitar and lead vocals and <laughs> we didn't have a sound guy. And That's amazing. So, uh, we would just be dealing with feedback, just a really bad PA. And like, I just cut my teeth on going and plugging my stuff in at the soundboard and mixing while playing. And, oh yeah. And then that turned into volunteering at a, uh, another ministry, uh, that summer. And I remember, uh, the first night uh, I'd been there for you know a couple of days doing rehearsals and kind of helping out with sound checks and stuff, but I'm 16 years old. I'm not qualified to be running a big PA in like this right. huge room that we were in. You're like, this has so many more knobs than my, <laughs> my crate guitar amp. <laughs> yeah. I had, a, I had a Mackie 24 channel and then I'm all of a sudden on like this huge 96 channel yeah. desk with all this outboard gear that I don't know what half of it does. Right. There's so many outputs. Where does it all go? Yeah. And so the the guy who was production managing, he uh, used to work for a band called Third Day. And he he just came up to me the first night, like 30 minutes before doors. He's like, hey, you're mixing. I trust you. And like what? threw me into it. And no way. It's like a thousand people there. And I'd never ran audio professionally and obviously wasn't professional at that time. Yeah. But that, across that summer turned into... Um, me doing stuff on the road with some bands locally and just getting a lot of opportunities out of out of knowing this one guy that worked it's for so day. cool you think about that one guy who trusted you enough or or maybe knew that like it would be okay even if it wasn't okay you know what i mean like yeah yeah like there's room to fail like, yeah there's this is a thing that that i think um is one of the good things of kids that grow up like i grew up going to church and spent a lot of my life in church and you you get opportunities there you wouldn't get anywhere else because there's just like this desperation of you need people to pull things off where else can a kid get thrown behind a soundboard you know i think right. even like you brad paisley and like most most like killer guitar players will talk about how they grew up playing in church because one day there was someone was like we need a guitar player and just right. tossed him a guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always joke about playing bass. There's certain guys that are really great at bass, and they chose to be that. But I always joke because I ended up playing bass eventually. Was yeah. Like, bass isn't something you choose. It's something that happens to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true, dude. Yeah, nobody, nobody's like, listen, I... Uh, I listen to you too, and I just think the bass is what I want to. I want to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he probably chose that, and that's why he's so good at it. <laughs> that's probably why. Yeah, yeah. Like there's, like there's probably. Very few really, really good bass players. And then there's a lot of guitar players who just like, they already had a lead guy. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's no room for rhythm. The, right. The front guy's doing that. Right. <laughs> there's, always, there's always that thing too in bands where like whatever instrument you play, you want to play a different instrument. So like whenever there's a break, the guitar player's on the drum set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like always like. You come back from catering and <laughs> guitar player's fumbling his yeah. way through. Yeah. It's a very simple beat. <laughs> oh yeah. He's been working on it the whole tour. <laughs> One day he's going to get it. 
Wouldn't it be cool one day we could just all switch instruments in the middle of a set? Oh my god, dude! I remember playing guitar in youth group, and we only had one amp, and it was like an old crappy PV tube amp, and it had two inputs on it. So we would plug the bass and the guitar in the no, same amp. No, <laughs> which I know as an audio guy, that just like part of you dies when you hear that, right? <laughs> I, I re- mean, the Fender had a whole like series of amps where they just made them that were. Oh, for yeah. that purpose, like you plugged everything in and this is how you did gigs. You yeah, know? like the basement, the old basement yeah, amps. Yeah. And those uh, things were built like tanks too. I remember seeing a guy at a gig. Ha- he had a like an old twin, which a Fender twin weighs like almost 90 pounds. Oh, and yeah. he freaking just like threw it over a fence. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> he just threw it over the fence, plugged it in and played the gig. A little down and dirty. It was like the, uh, the the Vox Beatles amps, like when Solid State became a thing. Mm-hmm. They were releasing these Beatles amps because they were like rock solid. There was no tubes that could shatter or break. And they're like, oh, this yeah. is the new technology. And then that lived about a year. And they're like, oh, oh totally. this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I saw, I did an event once with the Fab Four, who was like, uh, not the Fab Four, but like the Fab Four, like the tribute, Beatles tribute band. Yeah. And it's crazy, man, because I'm talking to the guys beforehand, and they're like, yeah, you know, we only use, like, the same gear that the Beatles use. And they do. Like, all their guitars are vintage, like, whatever, Gill, they're like, you know, like, yeah. all these vintage guitars, the same ones, same color, everything. And they have these massive Vox amps, like, those tall, like, 8 by 10 cabs. The ones that look like a coffin. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so, I was so stoked, and, like, I was helping them move in gear, and I went to move the amp, and it weighed nothing. I was like, what? And I looked behind, and it's just the shell. They literally just use the shell of the amp for the look, and they're plugged in like a little Line Six pod or some like crappy like module thing. Yeah. I was <laughs> really doing it just like the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so spot on, guys. It's just so funny to me that they were so committed to it. like even the guy who um, was playing Paul in the band. He's right handed, but he taught himself how to play everything left handed. No way, which is insane. And then I saw the amp, so I was like, this is a sham. <laughs> <laughs> so you started playing first, mm-hmm. but then slowly did it, was was mixing sound like like becoming the bass player for most people? Like, they're just like, we need someone to do it, and you learned it? Or did you did you find through that that you really, like, had a passion for? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely I had always dreamed of playing music, and that's what got me into it. And then... Um, out of necessity and learning audio. And then I got into like reading books, like the Yamaha sound manual that was printed in like the sixties or something. And like what? just learning like the really like the nerdy like, yeah. Odyssey stuff. Like I was taking physics in, in high school around the same time and was just learning like how to, how to solder and how to build pedal boards and how to do all this stuff. And my senior class, uh, final project for my physics class was I built a little amplifier Oh, that's rad. Like, everybody else had these like little like things you get out of the science magazine that were like really easy. And I was like just going over the top to build this like guitar amp. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, and then I'll have it when the project's over. <laughs> yeah. So I got into like the nerdy like physics side of stuff for a bit. And then, um, and then I started to read like these m- magazines where there was all these great engineers and I was just falling in love with the art of it and yeah. like, what it was. And, and, uh, that, you know, led into, uh, a lot of it was mixing at churches, which is where I kind of cut my teeth on it. But then it turned into mixing for these rock and roll bands and these clubs. I was like 18 years old going to all these clubs and, <laughs> you know, just hanging out like with these guys that were way older than me and way cooler than me. And like, it was just sort of the dream, you know, like, oh, yeah. li- living off of uh, cigarettes and hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a funny thing too. When you end up in an environment where you're like, I'm sh- I should probably shouldn't even be here, but I'm also in like a role that. I'm kind of in charge to some aspect. Like, Oh, yeah. I could totally ruin everybody's night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember doing... My cousin has a... He, my cousin did the podcast, but he has a, a rockabilly band. And when I was like 13, they would take me to bars to open for them. Like, doing magic tricks. That's awesome. And it was rad, man. It'd be like, uh, go do like magic tricks, open up. And then I, they'd like... They didn't have a guitar player. They, they had a, a keyboard or a um, piano player who played an upright piano. Who literally just threw it in the back of his pickup. And uh, so they didn't have a guitar player. So like, they're like, come play guitar. And I didn't know anything about like real music. I just knew like power chords and Nirvana. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I just stood there and looked awkward. But it is funny being a kid where it's like you're because you have this this talent or this thing you can do, you get accepted into environments that normally you wouldn't. Yeah. You know, kids aren't allowed to go. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Was that super weird for you when you started going from, I mean, you grew up doing church and you're, you're still at the time doing a bunch of stuff in the church, but then you're also going to bars and doing 
the club stuff and probably with some of the same guys who you're seeing on Sunday morning playing in the van. Yeah, yeah. Was that a weird vibe? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, some of it was not to call anyone out or say anyone's names, but it was just kind of funny to see what people were doing, you know, on Friday night in the club and then they were, you know, making their way at Sunday morning, hungover, smelling like cigarettes and yeah. <laughs> booze, like to go do their church game because they just played with their band the night before or whatever. It just, it gave me this perspective on on that the, the church is not, wasn't what I thought it was you know, initially and in, in a good way, like that there are legit people that are doing real stuff that isn't just this get up on stage and play four chord song kind of thing. Right. Yeah. There was a, there was definitely a switch. I remember when, when it went from being like three and four chord songs to like, Oh, we're really going to be intentional with bringing in real musicians and putting production behind stuff. And yeah, I mean, I could talk all day long about my challenges associated with that, but from a production side, it's, it was pretty right. awesome to be able to, you know, get those opportunities to work with crazy expensive gear when you're like a right, kid. yeah, man. Like you know, I you know, getting thrown behind a hundred thousand dollar console when you're seventeen, eighteen years old, and you're like, what in the world? Like I shouldn't have this opportunity to be mixing this, you know? Right. Um, uh, there was there was a festival that I was doing when I was like seventeen, and we were traveling to i think it was dallas and i had never been on a digital console in my entire life and i found out like halfway there i think we were in like mississippi i found out that there was a that was going to be on this console i had you know only seen pictures of in magazines so we when, when would this have been this would have been like uh 2004 2005 somewhere in there like kind digi- of like digital coming into play like changed everything it's yeah. like a totally different thing yeah, I feel like I'm very fortunate because there, there's some guys that are just a few years younger than me that never worked on an analog console. And then there's, you know, wow. guys that were a little bit older than me that really took a while to transition into the analog thing because they So you had the best up. of both worlds. You got to yeah. experience both. and Yeah. And uh, yeah, so on that trip, we were, we were like stopping at a McDonald's and I pulled out my laptop and downloaded the manual to this digital console to see if I could figure it out on the way and there. you're supposed to mix at this festival, like <laughs> yeah. the whole thing? Yeah. Like we were the, oh, we were like the headliners and I'm mixing and I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> oh my goodness. And so I got there, you know, and I, I just, you know, keep your mouth shut and like pretend like you know what you're doing and, you know, fake yeah. it till you make it. So I knew enough about the console to be able to like get things into people's in ears and like you know turn a reverb and a delay on a compressor and like make it sound decent you know? did you ever have any nightmares where like you you're talking oh, yeah. to someone and they're using the new lingo and you know that they know you don't know what you're talking about like yeah. uh, I, don't, I mean yeah i i've prided myself in just you know shaking my head and nodding me like oh yeah yeah of course the uh the thing magic that you just said that thing yeah of course you know <laughs> and, you go look it up yeah the, yeah and then i eventually <laughs> figure out what it is and, and and now i'm doing that with video <laughs> Yeah, dude. I faked audio for 10 years and now I'm three years into faking a video career. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you're, because the role that you're in, I mean, for especially a lot of these events that we do, you're calling the shots on the whole show. You're running the show. Mm-hmm. And yet, yeah, you can't just be like, well, I'm an audio guy, so I'm going to stick there. Like you have had to learn how to do the video and like the audio and be able to speak to the band on what they need and you know, this kind of microphone is going to be good for this type of speaker. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. And steering the conversation, steering people and clients expectations when a client walks in the room and like clearly things are not quite where they're supposed to be at today. And, you know, yeah, you know, like, you're like, oh no, it's, this is great. This is where I expected to be. And like until inside you're panicking. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, got to play it cool and figure out how to get it done. Um, that's, I mean, that's, 90% of it is just, you know, like I said, fake it till you make it even in the moment when everything is going to hell and no one knows how this is going to get pulled off. You're just like, well, we've got two hours to figure it out. We're going to figure it out, you know. Being able to keep your cool in the midst of that is nuts when you know it's not okay, but yeah. You know, it's like you don't know what the solution is, but you know you're going to you're going to find one. Right, yeah. Yeah. It's like a I don't know. It's like a grace thing. It's just like, like I don't know. It it always works out. Like that's yeah. just what you have to keep telling yourself. Like, yeah, I've been this panic before. It worked out. Yeah, I'll be fine. I, I was freaking out the other day, and a buddy of mine said, "Taylor, when has it not worked out?" I'm like, Shut up. <laughs> He's like, "It always works out." I'm like, well, "Yeah, but but right now I don't know what I'm going to do." He's like, "Yeah, but you're going to figure it out." Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember thinking before I was like behind the scenes in production that everybody in these different roles, you know, whether it was someone on stage or someone off stage in the production side, everyone just was so perfect and never failed and never had any issues. And then you get into it and you realize every show, every single show 
is chaos at some moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every single show is like, we've never had this happen before. <laughs> I mean, you we, we, we just you guys just did a show the other day where like on the loadout, you get a call and your tr- truck driver is oh in gosh. a different venue. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> we've had a crazy season where it's just like, uh, just, you know, we did 30 events in 30 days and it's just, you know, there's so much details and... So, yeah, we last minute changed where routing was going with these trucks, and then we had it right on the end, like load in ha- happened right, but then the trucking company didn't get the memo about that we had swapped to venues and that we were, you know, an hour and a half away. That, so the truck shows up in San Diego. I mean, we're pushing stuff to the dock, calling the truck, being like, hey, where are you at? And he's like, oh, I'm on the dock. We're like, no, you're not. And you're in Laguna. Yeah, we're in Which Laguna. is like an hour and a half, two hours away. <laughs> yeah, and he's in La Jolla. And- <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I got the law right. <laughs> I knew it was Spanish for something. <laughs> well, here, this is what's crazy too is like in your world, um, you also get what a lot of performers get with the whole travel thing because not only, and even more so, because not only do you have to get yourself and your crew there, but you've got to get like massive amounts of equipment. Yeah, sometimes like semi loads. Semi trucks of- full of equipment. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I mean, sure you've you, got some uh, stories of like, yeah, because I'm sure you had like up. you've like had something where you got there and like your your kit didn't show up and like you've got no yeah, props, you got nothing, yeah, yeah, or like you don't have clothes or whatever. It's like it's like that, but on a really massive scale. And so you've got a, I mean, you know, like I, I don't know. I remember Adam was telling me, Adam Christine was telling me oh, like yeah. one time that he his 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 whole like magic kit didn't show up, and so he had to go to this local shop and just pick up some stuff and end up meeting this amazing character named Ricky Devon. Yeah, Ricky Devon <laughs> in Asheville, North Carolina. Yeah. So it's it's sort of like that. Like we 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 have partners all over the US that like when something goes wrong, we call them and they're, you know, more than willing to help us and try to scramble and get some gear to us or yeah. whatever. Like I mean, Well and it's it's different from even like a guitarist who is like if their guitar broke or didn't show up, they can go get another guitar. Yeah, there's like, a guitar center. We, yeah, there's a guitar center right miles. next door. Yeah, and this is what amazes me how what you guys pull off is like if my magic stuff doesn't show up or my props or whatever I'm using for the show isn't there, if I got an hour or two, I can pull it off. I'll go find, you know, I'll go to the Dollar Tree and I'll go to Home Depot and I will make whatever I need to do it. Yeah, I've seen you guys do the same thing, and what's crazy is you've been contracted by the client to provide this stage and this you know, backdrop and this, you know, projection and then a piece doesn't show up and somehow I come back in the room and you figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As, as all of our hair is slowly gray. Right. <laughs> well, we were talking last night when you were, you were, I think you were back East and got a call for an event we were doing here where like half of the gear wasn't there. Oh, National Margarita Day. It was National Margarita Day. Yeah. And you were already celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you get the call. Yeah, we yeah. So we we get this call that all this stuff is going wrong, and we somehow like got one of our like contacts to call a warehouse guy in Miami, and he came in in the middle of the night, and we scrambled a truck down there, broke a bunch of lo- trucking laws, and <laughs> <laughs> oh, like as far as how long you can drive and all of that. Yeah, because now they because it used to be like you could just flood the numbers, no big deal. But now everything's electronic, so like you start the you start the engine and the clock starts ticking. You know? Oh, really? Yeah. And so these guys can travel for so long, and then they got to take a ten hour break or whatever it is. I don't know what all the details are, but we totally broke a bunch of rules ah. that day. But yeah, it was you were on that one, right? Yeah. On that oh event. yeah. And you're yeah. like, it was like Thursday night. Everything it was, was Thursday night. Everything and, was screwed up, and, and then there was like Friday missing morning. a bunch of gear. And then Friday morning, it was like it never happened. Like, you made calls and found vendors and like yeah, halfway yeah. across the country. Yeah. And then all, <laughs> all while still celebrating Margarita Monday all us. <laughs> or whatever it was, International <laughs> Margarita Day. <laughs> What's it like to have gone from, you know, being a kid who just wanted to play music to now being someone who knows all these other aspects that you never... It's interesting because it's like some of the times it's you're you're getting into some situation that you're not trained to be in or that you never like, you know, 16 year old guitar playing PJ did not see himself, you know, 14 years later. Right. Being a production manager, doing all these other details and being super detail oriented. You know, I got into it for the creative side of it and for the for the fun and the love of the art. And so this has kind of been um learning like the more depths of the art you know like yeah you hear about like a i was just listening to an interview of this kenyan runner um who was getting to the top of his game like was starting to be an olympic athlete 
And like, and he was just talking about how he was slowly learning how to run faster and like how much it sucked and how hard it was and like just pushing himself. And like, and so I see some of those times where I'm like being stretched and where I'm like doing something I never expected to be doing or learning some new form or whatever that it's like, this is, this is perfecting the art. You know, this is yeah. like, the, this is part of that journey. Like if I think that I've gotten there already, then, I'm, then I've missed it, you know, yeah, like, it's still a continual process and. And then, and then once you learn these new things, it's like, okay, well now I can apply that to my creativity. Like yeah. I can, you got, you've added more tools to the kit. Yeah. It's like, you, you know, can pull it out whenever you need it. And yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've told a couple of people that, that do this, like, you know, you've, you've got these guys that got into this business for the creativity and then you've got them doing paperwork and fill, filling out expense reports and timesheets and stuff. It's like, yeah, you got to figure out that you're using those people for the wrong reasons. Like they're not thriving personally and they're not thriving spiritually yeah and you're killing them with this stuff you got to find somebody who loves being organized and let them do that part of right. the job like let these guys create let them you know be the best production manager the best lighting director the best audio director or video director whatever that they can be because yep. if you're limiting it with this then you're you know they're they're gonna burn out they're not gonna be around much longer that's the goal is to try in whatever capacity you want to, you know, do your art. in. it's the goal is to get to the point where you can just focus on the stuff you love. Yeah. But in the midst of it, there's all this other stuff that like, you know, yeah. it goes back to the travel or the, you know, the financial side of it. Like, yeah. Or booking shows for yourself, you know, like for <laughs> your, like in your situation, like we had, uh, I was the same thing. Like, uh, you know, yeah. when I was freelance audio guy, I just had to like make sure I was constantly busy and it's like, Oh yeah. Like you were joking earlier today. You're like, Oh, I don't know why I don't just get a Netflix special. Duh. Like, <laughs> yeah. Know, it's like, yeah. I, was, I had a freak out that. moment and then I realized like, I don't know why I never thought of this. I'll just get a Netflix special <laughs> and then it'll all be fantastic. <laughs> Last night, man, we watched John Mulaney's new special. Oh dude, he's so funny. So good. And I, here's what's so funny is we're laughing. Like his, his, his work is so good. His comedy is so funny. If you haven't seen it, go watch, John Mulaney's new Netflix stand-up special from Radio City Music Hall. But I love that we're like 10 seconds into it and we both went, oh, when we saw the jib shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, look, at, we're noticing all the production in the show and like yeah, getting... counting cameras. <laughs> you're like, how'd they get that shot? There's no one standing on stage. How'd they get that yeah, shot? Like, they must have shot this three days in a row. <laughs> one with like all the cameras on stage and then like one without... We're like counting cameras, like, all right, that's the seventh camera we've seen. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> so because dumb. we, I mean, we both love comedy. We both love comedy. So, it's funny. We go back and forth from watching the comedy and enjoying it and listening to what yeah. he's saying and then get taken away by the beauty of the production yeah, because man. we're, you know, you spend so much time in that world. Do you find yourself doing that? Like going to events where you're not working and you're supposed to just enjoy this band or this performer yeah. and getting distracted either by how good it is or by how much better it could be if they would have done something differently? Right. Yeah. There's, I mean, yeah. When you go to, when you go to an event when there's like high production and like, it's kind of not landing well, it's like, it can be really frustrating and you have to kind of turn it off if you're going to enjoy yourself and then you other times you're just at stuff and you're like man i wish i was on this crew i wish i could yeah be like i want i just want to talk to these guys and see like how did you come up with this idea and like what's the inspiration behind it and then there's other times where it's like i just need to go to an event that isn't this you know yeah like i want to go to a coffee shop and see some dude fumbling around playing acoustic and you know, trying out songs that no one's ever heard and that kind of stuff or like or like for for me like i've had a long journey around the church and so like now when I go to church, I don't want to go to this thing that's like a high production, production yeah. like thing. Like I go to the the church that I kind of came up in when in my my night like eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. Uh, we go there because like there's places in the audience where there's no speakers facing it, and like you can't read the lyrics, and like you know it's just like <laughs> it's just not it's nothing like what I do, and that's what I like. It's just to escape from that high pressure, like high performance, high production. World. That's interesting, man. You know, you're attracted to it at first because of the production. And then when it becomes, your job becomes the production. Yeah. Then you just want something that's different. Yeah. It's, um, dude, that's crazy. It's like I'm, stretching and compressing or like, it's like the, like the, like a sine wave, like there's the crest and the trough. It's sort of like, you need that push and pull or the, you know, take and give kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like um, dynamics, I guess, like in a song, you know, like, yeah, 
you know. I I forget where it was. The um, the Killers were playing. It might have been at K Rock's Acoustic Christmas, but they were they were playing and they came out and they did their first song. They played Mr. Brightside. Mm-hmm. This was like this last year. They came out. They played their first song, probably one of their most well known songs, with all the house lights up, zero production on the stage. And they played the entire like seven minute tune, just the band standing on stage, stark lights, the neons shining up top, you know? And then on the last note of the song, it went dark and then full production. Wow. And it was, I, I think it was almost like a nod of like, hey, we still can just do this yeah. without all this stuff. Like, yeah. it's not just about all this stuff. That stuff is nice, but. There's something about, like you said, getting a, an acoustic guitar in a coffee shop in a corner that for guys who spend their whole world in production, that that can connect to you on a level that, yeah, you know. No, yeah. I, um, when I was uh, first started um, touring with this group, uh, I met this lighting designer. His name's Ed White. He's an amazing guy from England. He's he he's done everything from play with uh, Ellie Goulding to you know do these incredible lighting design things and um he he did this brilliant thing on his tour where like he across five or six songs there was new production elements that you didn't know were there they were just kind of tucked away and hidden yeah so it started with these like light bars and he was kind of running some video content through these vertical or horizontal bars and uh like real low res stuff and then these kind of just um kind of standard fixture lights come on like nothing led or or like yeah. impressive and he just does this with a bunch of haze for like a song and a half and then like these other lights come on and those like and so it eventually gets to this huge production it's building and it's not just like yeah and using then, everything you got in and the then, first moment and then it just cuts down to nothing for like a couple songs where it's just this <sighs> like acoustic performance where there's like banjos and stuff and like and it, like his his actual lighting affected the way that the performance of the band was like wow. you know it, it, like everything was kind of based around this he was able to like craft an experience from like you know leading from the lighting console yeah and when you have those guys that are just brilliant like that that are you know th- some video guys i work with that are that way and they're just coming up with things and they're doing them you know even for like a couple of dollars that there's come up with this stupid thing that was awesome and like changed the entire way that the event went and yeah so i don't that was all i'd say this ed guy really like what never i never really had any conversations with it about it it was just sort of like this observation of this like thing of beauty that doesn't don't come out and flash and trash in the first song <laughs> yeah. dude and this is so good for young guys and girls coming up because there's this temptation that everything has to be at this speed that the world runs at now yeah. like you know attention span is so short and everything's got to be quick and flashy and it's good for it's good for your up and coming guys and girls to hear like the, there's nothing wrong with just doing something at its like core. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. if you can, I remember guys like when I would play guitar growing up. I for a while I was getting so into gear and pedals and all this stuff, <laughs> and I spent all my time for a f- several years just looking at gear, and I never practiced anything new. And it's like. Then I would see a guy play literally just plugging electric guitar into an amp, using the gain on the amp and nothing else, and just shredding and going like, oh, yeah, there's like, there's something more to it than just adding layer upon layer of stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And just there's something just doing it for doing it, doing it for yourself, like creating art for yourself or just for the sake of the art and like that being core like to you like if you're if you're doing it if you're doing it to like you know if you're doing rock and roll music to get the girls or you're doing this thing to like whatever you're you're seeking an external fulfillment and that's never gonna work you know right and i i mean i definitely went through that like early in my career was just I wanted to be hanging out with the right guys and I wanted to be with the right crew and I yep. wanted to be, you know, landing the best joke in the green room or like the one liner. Or yeah. Whatever. And it, it was just killing me, you know, it was not, yeah. it wasn't who I and was. And it wasn't and, fun anymore. Yeah. And, and I, you know, was burning out, not in a professional, even in like a personal, like human spiritual way. It's just like, this is, 
I'm doing these things for these people. This isn't, you know, I need to be doing these things for me. I need to be figuring out who I am and what I want out of this. And like, yeah. what's the point in all this, you know? Yeah, buddy. And getting around the right people that allow you to do that. Yeah. When people, when you stop trying to perform for people and people start to be a catalyst for you to be who yeah. you are and for yeah. like, you know, that they, it's like the iron sharpens iron thing. Like the David, yep. the uh, David and uh, Saul's son, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, David yeah. and Jonathan thing. Like, you know, those two guys like just brought something out of each other. Yeah. You know? A lot of the events that we do, we are lucky enough to work with a lot of the same crew from from the groups that put these events on. And one of my favorite things ever is just our hangs afterward. Yeah. And sometimes I tease about not wanting to do like the magic afterward. Yeah. <laughs> but I swear it's my favorite thing. Like there's there's something so pure about being in a moment with like people that you love and and not having to worry about is my mic gonna work is you know what i mean like not yeah. having to worry about like do i have the right props but just doing the thing you love to do at the lowest common denominator yeah yeah it's like when a guy grabs a grabs a guitar at a party and you just start singing along to songs and he forgets half the chords and it doesn't matter because yeah. it's like yeah it's the freedom to fail you know? yes buddy yeah i worry that with social media and our need to filter everything and everything's got to be perfect and everyone looks great. I worry that young artists don't have that freedom to fail. I worry that geniuses are never going to reach their potential because they're so afraid of not doing it right the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that one of the good things about us growing up and getting these opportunities and probably getting those opportunities because there just wasn't an adult who could do it. Like if there was an adult who could do it, they would have just let that guy do it. Right, yeah. You know, but they needed a guitar player. They needed someone to mix. We get an opportunity to suck at something. And I feel like people forget that your favorite your favorite artists used to be shitty at whatever their art is. Like, <laughs> yeah. like Adele used to not be Adele. Right. Like, have you ever thought about that? Like, yeah. singing is probably not the best example because some people just so, have yeah, good just voices. Have that, but, yeah. You know what I mean? But like, whoever, like, take your favorite guitar player or drummer or like... They couldn't do it. They could yeah. not do it. Like Right. At some point Weezer couldn't write songs, you know. Right. Like, you know, right. Rivers, Rivers Cuomo was doing like trying to play uh, you know, Blister in the Sun or something by Violent Femmes and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Crap, I messed it up again. Like <laughs> Yeah. And now he like has notebooks and studies pop and like writes Oh, like, you know, he's writing stuff for other people. Yeah. yeah. And and but we look at these people and we go, gosh, I I'm not as good as them and then we shut down. Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, and your world that you live in is so interesting because as new gear is coming out more and more every year, like the technology is changing. So even like that move from analog to digital and sound, that kind of stuff, every year there's new things that are happening and you have to always be growing and always be learning. Yeah. But you also have to, I would think, give yourself the freedom to go, hey, I'm not going to know because it just came out. Like, Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and and if you take a, a too too long of a break from any portion of the knowledge base that you have, that then, then coming back to it, like you know, if I t if I don't mix in a very long time, and coming back to it, it's sort of like it's you know not necessarily the, the mixing or like EQing or compression isn't there, but it's just like oh, what how did I use this console the last time I was on it? Like how do what's my workflow here? And then yeah, and then if new stuff comes out that you've never touched and it's been out for a year or two, and everyone else around you is accelerating it and you haven't touched it or even been on it, it's like you're just you can't, you're going to be behind, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You got to stay on top of it. Yeah. How do you manage like the relational side of working with different types of people? Because you're also in an interesting boat where not only do you have a crew that you're working with that are like friends and coworkers, but you also have to deal with clients who sometimes, I mean, in the corporate world, I deal with this constantly. Like they've got an idea and they don't realize what it takes to pull that off. Like, they saw something on the Oscars last week and they want you to do it tonight on a, on a middle school talent show budget. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They saw, they saw like a, a million dollar performance and they, yeah. they've got 50 bucks for you. <laughs> yeah. They're like, listen, I think we could do this. It's going to happen on the patio <laughs> in broad daylight. <laughs> yeah. You remember that hologram they had of Tupac when he showed up? Could we do that with our CEO? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It would be something like that, right? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. there's there's so there's that side of things is like managing expectations. Um 
Yeah, you yeah. talked about that earlier. Well, you alluded to that earlier, but I think that that'd be something to, to talk about for people that that are maybe just starting to do this on a professional level and have just focused on the art or the skill and now are having to deal with people. Right, yeah. It's a whole different ball game. Yeah, um, yeah there's, there's always the challenge of somebody, you know, meet with somebody for ideation, just the general concept of what they want to do. And you start, you know, going through these things and you're like, oh, this is going to be really cool. Like you get excited and then like, you know, either maybe, you know, maybe you find out the budget immediately and you're kind of depressed or like you go and you <laughs> don't know what the budget is. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to put together the best show in the world for you. And then you turn right. it in and they're like, they just got the sticker shock. You know, they're just like, this is, oh, yeah. there, there's no way we, we, you just sent us something for, you know, hundred thousand dollars and we had 10. Right. I mean, that yeah, happens, that happens with performers all the time. People have, people have no idea if they've never hired a band or a magician or a comedian. Yeah. They have no idea what it would yeah, cost. Like they're thinking like, they're going to give you like 300 bucks for the four of you right. to show up and oh, you're yeah. going to have fun. And yeah. And yeah. somehow you're going to get here from three States away. And yeah. And you've been, you've been on the road for four days and they want you to stay in their kids room or like yeah. the, they want you to stay with like a host family or yep. something like that you know well and yeah. and i i think it's funny i you know i've said it a million times on here but i always you know i'll go do a show and people are like that was such a fun show that was great what do you do for a living yeah and they're, and they're shocked <laughs> like they can't believe that you actually make money doing this i've seen people do this to you guys yeah. too i've seen them come up to you and be like oh do you volunteer and it's like no we were brought here just to do this yeah yeah. And people can't fathom, on one hand, they can't fathom that you could make a living doing this, but then when they hear the sticker price of what it costs to travel across the country to do it, yeah. they're shocked by that. It's like, well... Yeah, well, it's, it's always funny because we're from Atlanta. We do so many shows out here in California, and then just people are like, oh, do you work here for the hotel? We're like, no, we're a production company from Atlanta. They're like, Atlanta? They, yeah, from Atlanta? They brought you here from Atlanta? <laughs> yeah. Like, you you have gear here from Atlanta? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it comes out here and it lives out here for a couple months and we come and wreck right. it and set it up. Yeah, they, well, so there's the there's that side of, like, where people want want more than what, you know, they have the budget for. And, you, you know, you always want to try to give them the best that you can. And so you creatively come up with something that works for them. And yeah. it's still cool and it's not, you know... You know, I, you know, I hope that we're graduating from just putting sticks up, on, like speakers up on sticks and pointing projectors at things, you know, like we want, um, we always say that we design with the end in mind. And yeah. so, well, and so an, you design with like the experience you want people to have, right? Like, yeah, what do you so want them to leave with? Yeah. So it's not just like, oh, let's do a bunch of LED and flashy lights and stuff. It's like, what do you want them to think about when they think back on your event a year from now? Yeah. Like, what's your big point? Like, what is this about? Yeah. And, you know, when you say that to people, they kind of, they kind of go, oh, right. We're not just trying to make this cool production. We really want people to walk away with like our slogan in mind or our message right. in mind, or they, we want them to be invested in who we are or to give to our calls. Right. Like, okay. Well, let's back up. How does this product that you saw on the MTV Music Awards help you deliver that? Yes. Because you know? if you're going to spend this money, you better be focused on what you want it to accomplish, you know? And, and that's also so good for people to hear who are considering hiring someone for any job yeah you can call a dj who's gonna come for 500 bucks and bring the same pa he brought to the bar mitzvah last night <laughs> you know what i mean to your room of 600 people in a ballroom or you can hire a company who's going to design a system that's specific to the room and the needs and the feel and the vibe that you want to have right yeah people don't people don't always realize that yeah. I think rightfully so. I mean, I, I would have no idea. Like, if I wasn't involved in this, I would have no idea what stuff costs. Right. Well, and then you have the other people that are, um, you know, they've already, they've already got you on site and then they're, they're, they think that they're the executive producer and that they're going to run the show and that they, that they have all these things. Right. And they're, they're like lingering, hovering over your video guy, like calling every cue to them. And it's like, you know, like, hey, we're, we're good. You know, our, yeah. our joking, like, motto that we always say is, ain't a hobby. Yeah. It's not a hobby. Ain't a hobby, bro. <laughs> Like, you know, like this isn't, we're not, this, I know that you, this happens at your church and the guy misses the slides and they forget to unmute the right. mic and there's feedback, but like, this is, like That's you said, this you is our career. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we're, I don't, I don't know what you do in your job, but I'm certainly not hovering over your shoulder telling right. you how to do your CPA work or whatever, you know. Adam Christing, our mutual friend who's been on this podcast. Um, mm -hmm. But he's the one who talked to me about like, 
when you're trying to figure out what to price and when you're shopping for something, there's different ways to price you, what you do and there's different ways to, to hire someone. The first level is price, then there's personalization, then there's premiere, right? So this is a dorky thing right now, but I freaking love no, it. No, I like this some phone, yeah. <laughs> so he's like, the, in any business, whatever business you are in, and if performers listen to this because this totally wrecked me and changed how I view everything I do. In any business you do, there's only three ways, he said, to be in business. The first way is you're in business because you've got a good price. Mm. That's the $100 birthday party band. Mm -hmm. and they're going to come out and they're going to eat all your pizza and they're going to, you know, it's 100 bucks and they're doing it for fun and they all have really good jobs during the week. But they're going to book a lot of shows at that $100 because they have the best price. Yeah, it's the like Costco That's, or the Walmart. Like Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Like nobody goes to Walmart because it's a great experience. Nobody. <laughs> nobody goes to Walmart because they're like, I feel better about myself and humanity. Yeah. People only go to Walmart because of the price, right? right? And that's fine. If that's how you want to be in business, you're going to do a lot more work for a lot less money, but you can you can make a living yeah. doing that. And a lot of people in our industry try to commoditize us is like, oh, right. you're just a sound, you're just, you're the soundboard and the sound guy and the thing, you know? Right. And it's like, we hopefully and, we're a value add to what you're doing. And yeah. And what you're saying is commodity. like, do you want a Walmart experience? Hire a Walmart sound guy. <laughs> <laughs> Hire a Walmart level production team, yeah. which is fine. Which look, if you're doing a second year old birthday party that the kid's not going to remember and the adults don't care about, yeah, then that's perfect. I, I had a and I have the companies. You, if you need those companies, ask me. <laughs> I can point you right to it. I had a friend who was talking to a client. <laughs> they were complaining about the price, and they're like, "Well, we want this experience. You know, we want people to have a good time. We want them to remember our event, but you know, we don't have a lot of money." And he finally was like. Have you considered a bowl of shrimp? <laughs> <laughs> People really like shrimp. <laughs> if you don't have a lot of money, just get a bowl of shrimp. <laughs> so anyway, so Adam says, Adam says you can be in business because of price. price okay. The second level of any business, whatever you do, uh, you, this is, goes for being a dentist or a plumber or a musician or whatever. The second level is personalization. People mm. will hire you because you're going to customize what you do to fit them. Yeah. Right. Uh, whatever they need, you're going to do. That's probably where I'm stuck right now is that I go from event to event and I change my act to fit them. And that's great. That's a sure. good way to be in business. And you can make a lot more doing that than you can doing the price point thing. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So he's like, so he'd be like, that's like, you know, a hundred dollar day rate for the price guy, the guy who's in it for price. Yeah. The guy that's in it for personalization, he's like the thousand dollar day rate. Sure. He's a hard worker and he's getting it done and he's making it all about you. He's like, then there's the person there then there's the premier level. The premier level is they don't call and they say we need a band. They call and they say we want you too. Yeah. And the price for you too is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> Yeah. Or whatever it is. You know what yeah, I mean? No, absolutely. And so he's like, you can be in business in any one of these ways. You can make a living in any one of these ways, but you got to figure out what your market is and what you want to do. And I think what you're saying is like, you know, in business, you guys are like, you're you're doing the personalization and you're moving toward the premiere. Yeah. But people don't understand yeah. that sometimes. And with it was with certain clients that really know us that we've done a lot of work for, we are premier to mm -hmm. them, and they'll they'll hire us no matter what. They're not trying to find the best price, right? They're not, and they're and they're they're thinking they put on an event and immediately they're calling you. Yeah, and we have it's our not we even, have our personal vendors that we work with all the time that yep. we're like we don't care about whether this is cheap or not. We need right. we need you because we trust right. you. We know you're going to show up and do a good job. And um and so yeah, there's there there's. There's definitely a good balance there of like you do you do want to be personalized to what these people's need because in our industry that's all that really there right, is you know right 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 um, but at the same time like we have best practices and standards and if you don't want to do that or you don't want to pay pay the price point for that then right. we're, not, we're not the right company for you like sorry but we're not you know oh totally and we're we're comfortable with that and we're comfortable with telling people that it's like it, you know we're just not going to do bad work like you know. <laughs> If the if you can't afford good work, then there's other companies for you. Yeah, yeah. and I sound I probably sound like a jerk saying that. But. No, no, no. I think it's good for I think it's good for artists to hear because especially for guys like you and I who grew up in church, where it's you do whatever it takes whenever they need you for whatever price they've got or yeah. they got no budget, and it doesn't matter. We're doing this to help people. Yeah, doing it to make a difference. It's. It, it's hard for both of us to talk this way, but it's important for people to hear that you. 
you have a limited amount of time. Yeah. It took me forever to figure out what to charge. I didn't know what to charge people. What's my day rate? And then I finally went, how many days a, a year can I work? Yeah. How much do I want to make a year? Simple mm-hmm. math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right? They teach you this in elementary school, Yeah, people. you take, <laughs> look, guys, whatever you're doing, if you're going, I don't know, I'm not making enough money or I'm not doing enough work. It's like, look, or I'm doing all these shows and I'm still not making enough. Look, how many shows can you do a year? How much money do you want to make? You just take what you want to make, you divide it by the number of shows, that's what your day rate needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's simple. Yeah. Oh, and I've got guys, my good friends of mine that are too busy. You know, like, man, I'm just too busy. And I was like, well, don't do as many events. They're like, well, I can't make as much money if I don't do as many. It's like, raise your if rate. You, if you're that busy, raise <laughs> right. your rate. You know, yeah. like you're undercharging for yourself. If you're, right. if you're, if you're too busy and you're not seeing your family, you're not seeing your kids, your wife, like, right. And do you value that? Then you need to be charging more and don't be on the road as much, you know? Yeah. Cause if you don't think about that now, then at the end of the year, you're going to be like, where'd all the money go? Where'd all the time go? You know, my kids don't remember what I look like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's like, so you go, you, you just figure out what it's worth to you and you kind of do it based on that. Yeah. I feel like we're, we're doing like a workshop now on how to charge for events. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about, um, you know, when you're at church and you're just sort of expected to serve and that, that kind of thing, uh, there's a, an organization that I used to work for still do occasionally. <laughs> Um, uh, it's okay they don't listen to this podcast no, they don't. I guarantee and, the, and the ones that do are more jaded than I am so. <laughs> um, you know who you are <laughs> some people who didn't grow up in the church right now are are you going to remember what you're going to say yeah, yeah. I was going to say people who didn't grow up in the church or not even grew up in the church grew up in the types of church we grew up in that are very high production value very yeah it's focused around a central leader oh yeah they don't understand that there's like this whole world of like production within the church. Yeah. Like so much money spent in people who are, their whole job is just to light things. And yeah, no, totally. I mean, you're talking about six figure salaries to turn on a light, you know? Yeah. Like that's ridiculous. We're obviously talking about the Catholic church. (laughs) We're, um, I'm sure. (laughs) <laughs> them and their lights no. <laughs> six, six figures to light the incense <laughs> yeah so we're talking about uh you know churches and being expected to serve or whatever the one of the one of the things internally at this organization that i used to work at that was they would just be, they would come in and be like hey, thank you guys for leaning in like we you know mm, we, they'd use this ugh. word lean in and one of my buddies was like <sighs> It like somebody like there'd be something really tough going on and they'd be like, yeah, we really need the production team to lean in on this and really pull this off. And he'd be like, man, sometimes you lean so far, you're just going to fall over. <laughs> uh, one of their other slogans that was super culty still is super culty. <laughs> super culty. Yeah. It's, yeah. It was, I always say, you know, you, you don't see those shows on like VH1 where they're like, and then I found out I was part of a cult. <laughs> I feel like my version would be like, and then I found out I was helping lead a cult. (laughs) If this is all news to you guys listening, you can go listen to my buddy Zach's podcast called Losing Our Religion, where I told my whole story. But anyway. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, it's like worship mercenary. (laughs) Worship mercenary. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Worship for hire. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole, like, you don't have to even be a believer in Jesus to get hired to play guitar at a church. No, you don't, man. I yeah, don't that's hey, look. If you're a struggling guitar player right now, <laughs> yeah, hey. just go work at a church. Hey, I can tell you the lingo. I can tell you the clothes. You got to dress like you're a shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> we're pilgrim hats. Yeah, we're pilgrim hats. <laughs> dress like a shepherd. shepherd you you mean like the long the, shirts? Yeah, you got to have ripped. You got to have ripped holes in your ripped knees. Holes in your jeans. And then you got to wear a uh, like a shepherd's wool clothing <laughs> that hangs down to like just above your knees. <laughs> And then have another shirt over that that so is that, appropriate length. Right. So that they can tell the difference. So they're like, that's a normal shirt. Clearly, he also does have the long shirt. He, he, you look like you're dressed like an extra from Waterworld. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always, I think it's so funny that in this certain, this unspecified church genre that we uh, grew up in, were involved in so long. Uh, the the they talk so much about like being relevant, and yeah, then yeah. they dress and act and talk like no one you've ever heard before. 
I don't know where they, like, I wouldn't know where to shop if I wanted to look like that. You don't see anyone else in the world looking like that. There's like a worship leader superstore somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> somebody has a really good Etsy store that they're just banking <laughs> right? off of. Right, totally. It's somebody in Hillsong. <laughs> yeah, it's some. It's like one word, like fuse <laughs> or fire or ignite. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Have we gone too so, far off no, the rails? So, or back wanted, on the rails? Getting back to the culty statement. That's what I was going to yeah, talk yeah. about. Let's get back to the culty stuff. <laughs> he. Uh, so one of the things was like, you know, like like sometimes like you say you show up and you're working in the parking lot at the church and like you just have to do that. Like that's what your gig is for the day. You know, yeah. like you're on the other team sometimes and this is what your Sunday is. Just happens to be raining and you're wearing the suit and out there waving the wand around. And yeah. so like, so one of their things was like, um, not that we have to do this, but that we get to. So, which, oh, you know, it sounds well and good when you first hear it. It's like, oh, I'm, I get to serve at my church. Like, right. I get to be a part of this. But then, it, so it's, it turned into that we may is the is their slogan. That we may. Everyone who knows who I'm talking about knows who I'm talking about. I want to say uh, that. Gross. That we may. Not that we get to, but that we may. And then that turned into um, we is greater than me. Which is the definition of cult mentality. It is cult mentality. Because it's like, it's okay to- You lose abuse, yourself to the- Yeah, you lose yourself to the greater good. So it's okay to abuse the individual as long as the greater good is accomplished or as long as the people at the top, you know, are still remaining at the top. Yeah. When I when I left the church, I thought that uh, this was like a unique way of speaking and acting that was like just toward this church that I was a part of. And then I found out that there's this whole network of churches that do the same thing. And then when I got involved more in Hollywood and LA and met friends who had like the same kind of horror stories, but about Scientology, oh, no, it's the same thing. It is the same thing. Yeah. Like if you watch Leah Remini on <laughs> her show about Scientology, it's like they talk the same way. It's all about like sacrifice to the greater good and like, What's uh, what is her show? I don't think I'm familiar with her. Uh, well, her book was called Troublemaker. So she wrote a book called Troublemaker, and then she has a show on. Um, hold on, guys. On the more successful podcasts, they have someone who looks this up. But I'm going to look it up right now. Scientology and the aftermath. It's on A and E. It's like in, in its third season. It's freaking crazy. You'll watch it and you'll go, "Oh my gosh, this is church." <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, we should probably say this. This is not. Uh, we're not saying that all church is bad. No, I think every organization has. Uh, whether you're <laughs> whether you're working for a church or you're uh, at Google or Amazon, whatever. Right. Like, you're going to have some. There's going to be some cult mentality. There's going to be something that's like you should be participating in being part of the horde. Um, right. And that that you you know it individuals inevitably will be abused um it's just that when you create a culture that is intentionally about abusing individuals and when yeah, you have people that dangerous. leave that leave your organization and have to go to counseling and yeah. and have permanent to semi permanent PTSD and yep. yep and and you have friends that are working there and you're saying hey one day you're going to leave this place and you're going to be like i wish i'd listened to what you were telling me ahead of time and yeah buddy i i when i went to my counselor for the first time uh, we were like three sessions in and I told her, I'm like, I think I'm depressed. Like this was after we left the church and literally overnight lost everyone and everything we ever had. That's like, ridiculous. Like in the process, lost all our money, lost our house, <laughs> lost, lost all of our friendships, lost my identity because it was all wrapped in this place. Yeah. And I went and I was like, I'm depressed. And she's like, well, and so she's like, we're going to do a series of like, questionnaires like to see what you're dealing with and she's like taylor like this is like her third session and she's like taylor you're not depressed she's like you are a clinical case of ptsd mm -hmm. she's like you, the things that and i and i don't want to try to even i don't even like to compare it because i can't even imagine what it would be like to go to war but she said like the same reactions you have to this situation is how we see people reacting to combat. Like it's just so unhealthy for a person to be in that type of environment that long. Yeah. And I think that it's really easy for artists, whether it's with a church or with a, a, an agency who is wanting to use you for your ability and, and, you know, take advantage of you. It happens in LA all the time. Yeah. 
it's important for artists to realize that there's nothing wrong with taking care of yourself and your family first and foremost. You know, like if you're not healthy, you can't give anyone anything. Right. You're you're going to be unable to create what the art that you're designed to create in the first place, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've I've had to I've had to not have a pity party about like how much time I spent trying to build someone else's dream mm -hmm. at the sake of my own family. And just go like, okay, well, we still got time, but the truth is life is short. You know what I mean? Like you don't know, none of us know what we got. And you might as well use that time that you have to to do something that brings you joy and brings others joy and and doesn't do it at the sake of your relationships, you know. Yeah. Whatever your gift is or your talent is, you get to choose how you want to use that. And you can use it to build a business for someone else, or you can use it to bring art and love to the world and provide for yourself financially. Yeah. And you get to pick. Like, we get we get to pick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that when people are struggling financially and their gig and, and their art and they're just trying to make it that there's a huge temptation to either give up or find something else to supplement your income. That's, I mean, all that stuff's fine, but I mean, ultimately I, I can look back on times when I had no money and was doing what I loved and like had so much joy and happiness, even though I was like, I don't know how I'm paying my bills. Yeah. That like just to not, for people to not pursue the money side of it. Yeah you know, over the art side of it. Like I get that you have to provide and you have to pay your bills and all that. But I mean, most people that really decided to be an artist had to make a really tough decision at some point to either leave a job that was paying them well right. or to leave some, some bit of security, take a risk. It sucked for a couple of years. Yeah. And then on the back end of it, it was all rewarding, you know? Yeah. And, and most of them would look back at those times when they suck and they don't remember as much of like the bills sucked and this sucked, but like the joy that was there when they were just doing what they loved. Yeah. You have to fight against the settle down mentality. Like I think in life there's this idea, like you get to a certain age and then it's like, okay, you're going to stop playing now and you're going to get serious and you're going to settle down. You're going to choose what the rest of your life looks like. Yeah. And I think artists deal with this constantly. There's always this temp temptation to go like, well, I'm making enough money now and I kind of enjoy this. So I'll just do this. It's not what I really want, but it's close enough. Yeah. And I think, you know, great, great artists. I mean, Eddie Murphy is probably the, one of the best comics of all time. Mm -hmm. Chris Rock would say Eddie Murphy is the funniest to this day. He posts like we were hanging out with all the guys. Eddie's the funniest. Eddie doesn't do stand up. Yeah. He just decided I don't want to do it anymore. You know, I mean, St Steve Martin, like, started doing stand-up, then went into acting, then went into writing novels, then started playing in, a like, a banjo bluegrass group. Yeah. And last year, we did an event last year that yeah. he played with the Philly Orchestra. No way. He, yeah, he's, we have a picture of him playing banjo. Amazing. Sitting in the front row amazing. of the orchestra. Like, that's Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> But, like, his whole life, I mean, everybody is, like, trying to say, like, well, stand-up's going great. Just keep doing that. You know? Or yeah. this, you know, movies. Why aren't you making as many movies? People loved you. You made so many number one movies. Why don't you do that? And then he's just, I want to play banjo. Yeah. That's where the art is. Yeah. For a while, it was writing. For a while, it was, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I love artists that don't let themselves be pinned down by. Yeah. Just settle. Just. Yeah. And I think that I think that if there's younger guys, especially that if you're thinking that later in life you're going to have a better situation to where you can you can more afford to do it or something like that, it's uh -uh. not coming. It's harder to do later. Right. Do it while you're young, dude. Make the leap. Like you don't have any responsibilities right now. You don't have bills to pay. You don't have mouths to feed. Like do it while you're young. Yeah. Make that decision. Like I mean, I'm speaking from experience. Like I went through. Years of just it, you know, going through the suck, you know, embracing yeah. it, embracing the suck, you know. And Look, I 
Yeah. And yeah, because I mean, you especially like had to do it later in life. Like you had to go through the suck when you had kids and like yeah. when you had to make, you know, you unfortunately had to make a hard decision and it's, you know, I would imagine that you'd say it's better now, <laughs> you yeah. know, like oh, it's yeah. all paid off. This is amazing. And you're doing what you love, you know, like that, that, that do it early in life before it really, really sucks. Yeah. But it also doesn't like, it's not easier now. Like it's, no, you no. know what I mean? I, when no, I, no, when no, I say yeah. that, like people think like, well, then I'll get enough money and it'll be fine. It's like, there's always, I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing very well with what I'm doing. However, this year we had bought a house last year and this year half of the stuff in the house broke. Right. Two days ago, before you guys showed yeah. up, I had to replace a hot water heater yeah. in two hours before you showed up that we weren't planning on buying. You know what I mean? Like right. I have two daughters that, that I took them to a regular dentist appointment and found out that day I was going to spend $7,000 on braces oh that gosh. day. Like, oh, they're starting braces now and this right. is going to be what it is. So, you know, this idea of like, it's just going to get easy. It's always a challenge. There's, you're never going to have enough money. You're never going to have enough time. Right. You might as well spend the time and the money you have doing the thing you love with the people you love. Yeah. Like why freaking waste it? Right. Yeah. No, I, I have a friend who does mar marriage and like life counseling and stuff. And he has the same thing. Like some people like are waiting to get married until they get this oh, next dude. promotion or, or they're, they're waiting to have kids until they can afford it. And, and he's like, there's never a time where no. you think that you're, you just keep pushing it back and keep pushing it back and it never, it's never going to come, you know? It's yeah. Like, just take the leap, you know? It's funny too. Like you hear uh, celebrities who like have kids in their sixties, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like way, way later in life or like, or, you know, someone, someone becomes a homeowner when they're in their fifties. They tell the same stories that someone told in their twenties when they were having kids or buying a house. Like you're never prepared for life. Yeah. It's not like you reach some golden age and everything works out. Right. Nobody's ever prepared for any of this stuff. Yeah. Nothing's going to prepare you for the thing you want to do other than doing it. You right. know what I mean? Like yeah. things, they, and there's always going to be those times, I mean, I'm sure you've had this happen, where there's those times where you're doing the thing already and you just feel like even in the middle of it, I can't do this anymore or I'm not, this is not for me or I want something different. Like, did you ever have a moment where you were like, that's it. I'm, I'm out of this. I'm going to do something else. Yeah, totally. Uh, it was a, it was about a 10 year journey when I was 16 years old. The, um, the production manager that I mentioned earlier, the guy that worked for the third day band, um, took me to a concert for this one organization that, uh, I had kind of been following and they were doing this really cool production stuff. Like all their stuff was in my world, just the top of the game. Yeah. And, I sat there, I remember it was at the Fox Theater and I was in the uh, second or third row of the balcony and watched this whole thing. And then it ended and I went down on the floor and just stood at front of house and watched them load out. Like I was just, and I was just okay. kind of watching some of the guys, like one of the audio guys and whatever. And in that moment I was like, this is, this is what I want to do with my life. Like I want to, I want to be in this environment. Like I want to This be, is when you were 16. Yeah. I was like, I want to be doing shows at the Fox Theater. I want to be doing arena shows and yeah. I want to. And it, like specifically the the organization that I was there watching, I wanted to work for. Mm. And so um, I just sort of made it a life goal. Like at that point when I was 16, that was like my goal. I was like, I want to go work for these people. Yeah. And so every chance that I got, that I got near the fringes of their camp, I would get involved and like try to like push in to like be a part of it. And, you know, I wanted to ultimately just be doing sound for them. And, um, and so I've eventually... About seven or eight years later, I was 23, 24, and I got a call from them to go on tour. And basically, I was the position that we commonly refer to as patch bitch, <laughs> which, <laughs> which means that I... Describe patch bitch. I, yeah. Patch bitch is uh, you are setting up the microphones and plugging them into the sockets on the stage and putting them in front of the instruments. <laughs> You're not running sound. You're not doing audio. You're not interacting with artists. You're just plugging in microphones and like helping set up the PA. And then, like, and then you can't screw this up. Yeah. And they basically just needed this guy that would do multiple things. And so I would do that a couple other little like merch things that help set up merch. And then I'd run, I've done, I'd run lyrics during the event. Yeah. And then at the end of it, I'd go and you know tear down my lyric station, go tear all, all the audio, put it in the truck, go sleep in a bunk for about six hours and get up and rinse and repeat. And that yeah. was, so that was my first tour with them. And then uh, about four or five months later, uh, they were doing another tour and I somehow had 
convinced uh, the guy in charge of the organization that I should be the production manager. And uh, <laughs> how did you do that? How did you go from patch bitch to I'm going to run the show? Man, I again fake it till you make it. Like you know, like all the all the confidence in the world, you know, right. none of the know how. And uh, and I had done a little bit of you know uh, of production managing with some other bands that were just you know whatever like rock and roll bands that were doing club touring and stuff. So I knew a little bit of like what it, it means that I got to just make sure the lighting guy's doing his job and the video guy's doing his job right. and the audience yeah. is doing his job. I was like, I, I can boss be around all day, sure, <laughs> you know, and. Uh, and so then uh, the guy that was going to be uh, tour managing, so production managing is you're sort of in charge of all of the gear getting mm-hmm. set up. Tour managing is like you're in charge of meeting with the, um, you know, the booking agent, the uh, the guy who uh, from the radio, like all the radio promo people, right? Um, all the people that are putting on the show, um, every detail, every, everything. So you're dealing with them. You're negotiating while the band is on stage you're looking at ticket sales and advertisement <laughs> spending and like all this stuff and negotiating how much money you're walking away from the table with wow and um and i don't know i didn't know that any of that world you know and <laughs> again i just faked it and <laughs> and so the guy that was going to be doing that he he had back surgery okay and what his doctor was like you can't go on the road yeah and so now i'm production managing tour managing and i think merch managing at the time oh or my something goodness, like that dude and so i went from just being this like you know audio guy that's just trying to get in with them to like now i'm like legit running the ship oh, and dude. so it it lasted for a couple of tours um i had a blast there's so many things that i would not change um i toured the entire world we like went all over the place did a bunch of stuff in asia um, yeah we played in Dubai, which oh my is crazy. Goodness. Like, played in Singapore. We played in Manila. Um, two, we played twice in India. We played twice in South Africa. And every day is different. Yeah. Every day is full of adventure and challenge. And yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. One, one of my favorite things was uh, our production manager on that tour. Actually, uh, it was an English guy named Ian. He makes a bet anytime he does international tours that with the audio company that if they can get every single patch correct yeah before sound check like when we go to sound check if every single channel is working and is showing up in the right spot he'll pay them each 100 bucks what and it for every channel that's for every channel that's not patched correctly they owe him, they owe him 10 oh my god and they, these are these are third world countries so he's right. ne- he's never once collected but he's never once paid <laughs> really yeah he's never made anyone actually what? pay him the money but he's never once he's had never to pay. paid them they, they'd never get it right oh, <laughs> so oh, bad, man. Yeah. <laughs> um and, and so yeah at some point like when i was so that was that started when i was 16 that I was at that concert and then when i was 26 i was just you know i was in the middle of this tour and i was just over it like i was stressed i was working too hard um we were we were touring with two buses and a semi like full production crew. Um, and I'm still doing the same thing. So we went from like, you know, eight guys in a bus to, right. To now we've got a whole crew and I'm still production managing. I'm still tour managing. I'm still doing all these jobs. that should be a couple of people's jobs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it was, it was more than just the stress. It was just sort of the, like realizing that this wasn't fulfilling me. Like, and so yeah. I basically had this dream just clocking in. Yeah, I had this dream. I was like, this is what I want to do. And like every single part of that was fulfilled. And I was at the top of like where I wanted to be. Like right. the 16-year-old PJ would be losing his freaking mind. I know the 26-year-old PJ was doing this gig, this gig. Yeah. And I was at the top of it. And I was like, this isn't it. I, this is not where I want to be. There's got to be something more, you know? Yeah. And uh was fortunate enough to have the right people around me to have a way out and to turn and uh, now work for uh, Velocity Productions is a company that I work with. And I have the greatest network of friends that are so all on my team. Man. Like some of my best friends I work with oh, and, dude. Um, and you know, a lot of them and oh, yeah. they're all great dudes. Like, <sighs> so we have so much fun. Um, so yeah, it's, it was just a crazy thing to go from everything that I wanted to having it and going, this isn't it. Yeah. It's crazy when you get to that point where you're, yeah, like you said, you're doing the thing you dreamed about and you're yeah. like, and you're young. I mean, at this time you're 26 and going like, yeah. And now what? Well, it also gave me this like hope that was like, all right, well, this was the biggest dream that I had. I clearly am not dreaming big enough. Yeah. What is the next dream that I could have that is bigger than my reality or my yeah. me, my means to accomplish it? Yeah. So what is that dream? I don't have an answer. I can't tell you. Like, <laughs> yeah. I have these kind of ideas, these lofty things that I don't have that I don't have words for or like 
what it's more of a feeling or a sense, you know, it's beyond accomplishment. It's beyond yeah. something. It's like, this is, it goes beyond accomplishing a goal or accomplishing a dream to just being, to just being, you know, like to just be that thing. You yeah. Know? I don't know. That's really abstract, but it's, dude, I love it. It's like, it's beyond just a, I love it. A thing that I, that I have to climb a mountain or that I have to be at the top of this thing. It's like, no, I just want to escalate beyond something that is verbal. <sighs> You know, there's these monks that, um, that, uh, don't, that will, they stop, uh, they stop talking Yeah, because language is so limiting. It's crazy. So like expressing an idea with words wow. is always going to be limited. So yeah. it, like to remove words, to train yourself, to not speak, to not have to be limited in your thought by what your English language like confines you to. Yeah. I know, I'm going really weird. <laughs> Dude, I freaking <laughs> love it, man. I love it. Because I think so many people, they, it, it's funny. You talk to young guys and they're like, I just want to tour. And then you talk to guys who we know that are touring and they're just like, I just want to be off the road. Yeah. No, yeah. It, everyone, traveling, want, everyone wants to be somewhere they're not. Yeah. Traveling for a living for a living seems so glamorous. Like, it's horrible. On TV. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great until you have to do it every week. I'm, gra- I'm grateful for it because when I arrive, I sometimes get checks. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are always like, why are you going to Fargo? I've heard there's a check. <laughs> <laughs> big fan of the movie. <laughs> big fan. Big fan. Big fan. Um, but yeah, no, it, it always sounds, it, it always sounds glamorous till you do it. Like if your whole, if doing it is the reason to do it, you need, just do something else. Yeah. No. And if a, making money is the reason to do it, make money some other way. There's so many good ways to make money. Yeah. You know, if it's if it's about if it's about the money, there's a lot of better ways to make. Oh, there's a, a lot, lo- a lot more money ways <laughs> yeah. to make more money. Like start a church. Or <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I can take that out of you. Oh, you sniped me. That's good. <laughs> One of the things that I've noticed working with your team, and I've said this to a lot of people on the team, doing the events with you guys was like, and they brought me hope for people again. Because I was at a point where I was just like, I'd been just let down by the yeah. world. <laughs> yeah, man. But um, it, it, it was encouraging to see people who were very good at what they did, but were also very good people. You know, and what, what have you learned in all these different roles that you played? that are most of them very selfless roles. Like I would say that like in the, in the audio visual side of things, nobody even notices you until something goes wrong. And then yeah. like you get all the hate, the sound guy, neck crane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some, the second something feeds back. Everybody's. Yeah. But you don't, but on the reciprocal side, you don't always get the love when it goes flawless. Oh, and then yeah. they give the credit to the speaker or the band or whoever's on stage. Yeah. Yeah, what have man. you learned in in this business just about being a good person and, you know, how much of that plays into it? Yeah. I mean, we definitely have some some people um, that love to wait for our failures or to like, maybe they don't love it, but when it happens, they just, they have to point it out. And I, yeah. I want to go, you didn't see, you saw the one thing that went wrong. You didn't see the five things that we did that prevented other failures and which it's fine. That's the nature of what we're what we're doing or what we do um but the the i think one of the number one things is like if you mess up just go ahead and address it like just go ahead and own it don't try to cover it don't try to whatever just go hey that was my bad yeah honesty and like being a real person gets you buys you more grace yeah than any excuse you're going to come up with right or any any reason why it's somebody else's fault or right how it was out of your control Yep. Just to be really honest, be like, hey, you know, we, we know what the issue was. We know what the solution is to it. it won't happen again. Yeah, that's you know? so good, man. We've also created a best practice and a best standard for future events that will prevent this from happening again. You know? Yeah. It shows them that, that you're actually putting things into play. Yeah. Because what you don't want is for them to just keep experiencing the same thing. And th- then you're just the guy that's blaming it on someone else or right. you're blaming it on the situation. Yeah. Because then no, no one wants that, you know? Yeah, man. I've, I've really, it's, it's helped me in situations when you deal with difficult people, just to think about where they're coming from too. You know what I mean? Like these event planners, whether it's a corporate thing or like a major, even festivals and concerts, like the amount of money that these people are putting out and hoping that they make it back or make a profit. Yeah. 
And then the people that we're dealing with often have all of this weighing on their shoulders, you know? And so you, you got to realize like they're going to bed with a lot of pressure on their neck. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. To like get and, it right. And for months leading up to it, it's their only concern. You know, like it's for example, I was telling you earlier, 30 days or 30 events, each of these events are four or five days long. Right. 30 events in the month of April. It was actually like 126 days of shows in a 30 day period. So for the individual that I'm dealing with on that show that I'm on for those three or four days that I'm there, it's the only thing that they've been concerned about for three or four months. Yeah. Maybe even a year. Yeah. Sometimes our clients are planning their shows two years in advance. Yeah. And we're checking in periodically with them. And we're obviously without, without that kind of communication, we can't advance their show and make it work. Right. But for me, I've just come off of three or four days of hell to, yeah. to have a couple of days off to come to your event. And like, you're my most important thing in the world right now. And I realize like that we're going through this together, but for you for three or four months, it's been this for yeah. me, my past three or four months has been your show and the other 15 or 16 that I'm managing this month. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you have to really, a lot of clients need hand holding, and then other clients are just like, they, they trust you and they're going to get out of your way. You know, that's so good, man. It's so, it's so good to like shift your perspective. Cause if you're just thinking about what you're dealing with, it's like yeah. this client doesn't, not only do they not know what I'm dealing with, but they, their job is not to worry about it. Like the reason they hired me is so they don't have to worry about right. it. You don't have to think about the details. You don't have to ask the questions. Right. And if you are having to ask those, then maybe I'm not doing a job or maybe you're just like that micro manager type person. But, but yeah, my job is not to go. Hey, I've got 15 other events this month that I'm in charge of. My my job is to, to to in a way sympathize with the client or with that person and go, you've been concerned about this for three or four months and you've put up a lot of money and you really you don't sleep at night because you're worried that like the outcome of this event or what your people are going to walk away with isn't what you hoped for. Yeah. And I'm the one person that's in between you and that. Right. Or I'm the one person that you've chosen to partner with to accomplish that. Yeah. You know, it depends on the client, which 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 way they see it. Like Yeah. You know, and so I, my goal is always to, is to be like, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in this with you. We're in the trenches together. Let's figure this out. You know? Yeah. That's in, you guys have been successful because you, you do such a good job that, that a one-time booking turns into a client relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And you're also thinking from that perspective of like, I want this person not just to feel good today. I want them to want to think of us when they, when they look at their calendar and they're booking their next event. I want the first call they make after they book a venue to be to call Velocity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And some of those clients, like we've we've had a lot of them for years and some of them are like new. And I, I just love it when I have relationships with our clients. It's like, that like I enjoy working with you. Like I look forward to your events and like, you know, we're buddy buddy and like mm-hmm. we like make jokes and I can text you even when, right. even when we're not even talking about your event. That's I can just best. text you and like, we're just, it's fine, you know? Yeah. And those are the, that's what a lot of our relationships are because, because we've, you know, delivered excellence time and time again with our clients and- they, they love us for it. And like, we're more than just clients. We're friends and yeah. It's so good, man. I know this isn't a, this isn't a how to podcast. This is more of a, how to survive, <laughs> which I think we've hit on a lot, but I, I would, I'd love to hear because you, you're in an interesting role where not only have you played all these different, put on the, these different hats for events and played all these different roles, but you are also now in a position where you're, you're looking for people to fill different roles what what advice would you give today, like in 2018, someone who's coming up wanting to do production that maybe you didn't know back in the, you know, early 2000s when you were starting to do this stuff? Any advice that you would give guys that might give them a head, you know, a heads up or help them other than things we've already talked about for the last hour and a half? Yeah, I always joke at your time that someone's like, how do I get into doing what you're doing? I was like, you don't want to do this. <laughs> I love that. That's the best answer ever. Because if they're like, okay, then it's like, well, you definitely shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. You know? If I tell you you don't want to do this and you're like, no, I I need to, I have to, I want right. to, like, then yeah, you got the right drive for it. But um, I think the biggest thing is like, especially when you're young, like that eagerness to be a part of something um, or or like the once you start doing the thing and you're like, you're good at yeah. it and you're starting to get like to where you're confident in yourself and other people are confident in you. Yeah. Stay humble. Like I, I work with so many like these younger kids that are like coming up in it and it's like, you know, I'm just like, man, yeah, you're, you're pretty good. And you're like, you know, you're the hot stuff for being the new like 19, 20 year old kid on the scene, you know, 
but like you haven't been through any of the stuff that these guys that are in their thirties that have been doing it for 20 years, you know, thirties and forties right. doing it. It's like, yeah, you may be talented at the one thing that you, you might be able to, you know, make a band sound good, but like right. you're not, you, you, you don't have all of the experience that you need. And the only way that you're going to get it is by shutting up and listening and like, just, you know, really humbling yourself. And I know I come across and say like, shut up and listen, but I mean like humble yourself, be eager to learn. Like, and even like, even if you learn that early, then when you're in your, you know, thirties and forties, like if you still have the eagerness to learn, you're going to continue to be successful. That's so good, dude. Because once you think that you know it all, then right. you stop learning and, and then you'd stop succeeding. And nobody wants to be around someone who thinks they've got it all figured out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a big part of it is like, we do so much, so much of the work. You're spending a lot of time with people. It's like, I don't want to work with people. I don't want to be around. Yeah. Yeah. And like, <laughs> for, yeah. Yeah. Especially like these cocky young kids, like you're not going to get any work by doing that. You know, nobody mm-hmm. wants to be around you. Um, and then like, uh, don't ever be a white glover. Like don't in, in my <laughs> what does world. That mean? What does that mean for you? So guys? a white glover is someone who doesn't like to get their hands dirty. Like they can wear white gloves all day and they, you know, their gloves yeah. are going to stay white. They're not going to get gray or dirty or whatever. Yeah. Um, especially when you're younger, the older guys that I work with that like have the respect in the industry, it's like, I'm only hiring you because I know that you're going to operate this thing. Well, like right. I kind of expect that you're not going to, you're going to like, you're not going to be climbing a truss. Yeah. Two minutes before showtime. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm probably hiring the younger kid to do the job that you don't want to do anyways. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like just always work hard, like be super eager to jump into situations. And if you're the audio guy and you see a lighting or a video problem, you can just help in, even if you don't know what you're doing, like get involved and, and like be a part of the solution. Like don't, don't ever be like, Oh, it's not my department. It's not my problem. Like what production managers and what people that are owning companies and businesses look for are, people that will do more than just what they're asked to do yeah that's good pj i think it's so freaking encouraging man you and i both can think back to names of people and faces of people who we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if they didn't come before us and i think it's rad that you care enough to share your story and your journey and i know it's going to help other guys so thank you man no thank you man that means a lot appreciate that i mean it from the bottom of my heart and i can't thank you enough for just on a personal note this podcast really is uh beyond being a passion project this is therapy for me man yeah and it really stemmed from conversations like the ones that we had till three and four in the morning on events <laughs> you know you get past the surface stuff and you start really getting into the life stuff mm-hmm. and um i'm just grateful for you man i'm grateful that you would be open enough to share your heart and your life and um uh, to a guy who is as broken as I was when I met you all, that you'd bring me into the into the team and let me be a part of what was going on. Um, friggin' means a ton to me. So, yeah, thank yeah. you, dude. Well, likewise, man. Yeah. You know that. All right, we're gonna we're gonna braid each other's hair and cry and stuff. <laughs> um, we'll turn this off. But thank you, man. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, man. You're freaking red. Yeah. All awesome. right, buddy. All right.